uh, so much for this day and for the time uh, that we get to uh, be out uh, preaching the gospel and the time uh, of fellowship that we're able to have here today. We just pray that you would uh, be glorified and exalted in, in all that we do here. Pray that you fill pastor with your spirit to deliver the message today and open our hearts to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> that chapter that he read doesn't have anything specifically to do, I should say, generally doesn't have anything to do with this sermon, but I will come back to that and you'll see uh, why, why I have that uh, passage of scripture. He asked me whether, for the scripture reading and I said, well, we don't really have a text, which is funny because I'm, um, this lesson is about how to prepare a message and your message has to have a text, right? Because you're preaching from the Bible. But what we're trying to do right now in the spirit of the uh, you know, the ministry training workshop. And what I failed to mention last Thursday, by the way, is one of the things that I was going to have you do if you are interested in preaching and many have already preached and some have expressed a desire to preach, uh, you know, start thinking, you know, we don't have a sign up right now, but start thinking uh, about some of these things and applying to yourself. Hopefully you already did, but this was the purpose of this. And I was going to say that we're going to do another uh opportunity to preach and I know it helps to give you something but I want you this time to come up with your own topic you know or whatever it is and using kind of the same idea here what the Lord puts on your heart and how he did that and if you will uh, start working on that uh, I'm gonna need a couple guys that I'm gonna have to call on to uh, preach here pretty soon in Iola and so that would be one opportunity for somebody to did to uh, preach and then obviously here uh, we'll have some uh, opportunity. I'll give you opportunity on Thursdays as well. So be thinking about that as you preach. And many of you guys I know already have the uh, basics down on how to put together a sermon, I'm assuming, because many of you guys have already preached and you do a great job. So you must have something in, uh, you know, already in the works. But one of the most common questions I get as a pastor is, you know, how do you come up with all the sermons that you preach and how do you go about putting them together? And so the purpose of this, and this is, I'm finishing up here, this is part two. The purpose is, is not, I am not an expert pastor, I, know, I mean preacher, I know that. I'm not like the most sought after, like let's see how to preach. But I'm, I've still been doing it, I have some experience, and so I'm one, my goal is to share with you what I do know and to be a teacher in this way. And so I'm, I'm going to try my best and also the way I go about doing things sometimes isn't the way everybody else does. And so, uh, uh, so hopefully this will be helpful to you. And not all these things are going to work exactly, but I'm, I tried to allow for that a little bit. Okay, so uh, we will look at a few examples. And ultimately, uh, here in a minute, what I'm going to write on here, last week I provided a, uh, a, an example sermon that I had preached the Wednesday before on alcohol. I just, no particular reason, I just picked that sermon because I had freshly done that and I knew I was going to be teaching this lesson. So I thought about that as I was going through the points and I wanted to be able to explain to you how I came up with all those points. Uh, today, when I, I might make reference to that a couple of times if you remember that. Uh, somebody was able to get a blessing out of that last week. And so they had no interest in preaching a message, but they read those sermon notes and got something out of it. So look, if you allow the Lord to do it, you'll get something out of the sermon today. If you don't know how to present the gospel, today uh, we'll go through some points and hopefully help you to be able to present the gospel. And so this is what I'm going to use as a, as a reference or an example uh, today, but it'll be a few minutes before I get to that. And most people in here know how to do that as well, but I'll go through um, some points here. Okay, so number three, we're just picking up where we left off last week. <clears throat> um, not even going to make reference to the points last week necessarily, but number three here is putting together a rough draft and editing it. Now, everybody here went through high school. I'm wondering how many had to make outlines. Maybe you had to, to, to do a speech or something. Is everybody pretty familiar with the idea of making a, you know, putting together an outline and coming up with a rough draft? And all right, so, you know, some of this will just be kind of a refresher. But uh, using what I put last week as far as how you come across the getting the topic or the text or whatever, and then how to go about just drawing a bunch of stuff and looking up a bunch of stuff from the Bible that will help uh, get you this information. Now we're going to put together a rough draft and begin to edit it, okay? Oh, so we have a basic idea. We've got a main point that we're trying to show. We've got maybe a potential title is what I talked about uh, last week. Uh, it could subject to change as you add certain, even sometimes an illustration, 
You know, it'll be an illustration that you're going to throw somewhere in that sermon that's going to really bring all those points together. Sometimes the title of the message you'll draw from the illustration because that's what's going to be memorable. And so that's a possibility as well. Okay, uh, so you have that, uh, the, all that basic information. Now you're going to put together a rough draft. Start typing or writing. There's your blanks right there, typing or writing. How many are pretty decent typers in here, you would say? I'm pretty good. I can sit down at a computer and type a lot. All the guys in the business, uh, <laughs> business uh, field. I, I was not a great typer in high school. I learned how to type, but I wasn't a great typer till I went to Bible college, and I was constantly having to put out all these different They They're always asking you to do things. And it would, at first, it would take me a long time. But after being there for a couple of years, that's, a, that's one benefit of going to school for that. And being there a couple of years and having to constantly put out papers, I got pretty fast at typing. And so I'm just telling you from my experience, if you get good at typing and you, you know how to use a word processor, it's going to save you a ton of time rather than writing stuff out by hand or, uh, uh, you know, I don't know what else is out there. Maybe there's some new stuff, <laughs> you know, I don't know, voice uh, texting or something. I don't know how people do it now. But I'm going to be talking primarily about how I do it. And what I have is just an old-fashioned word, you know, processor. And, uh, and so this is the idea. I start writing stuff on there. And learning to type faster and use a word processor on a computer can exp exponentially cut down your overall time of sermon prep. Remember last week I talked about how some preachers have said, man, it takes them like 12 hours to prepare a sermon. And I'm not knocking that. I have respect for that. And I wish I could spend more time each sermon to be able to prepare. But I'm telling you this, I wonder what some of that study time includes. And, you know, some of it has to do with just, you know, I've, I've talked to some of these guys back in the day whenever I heard that. And, you know, they didn't know anything about technology. So you, you got, you, you know, problems that are created there. But I'm telling you, once you get good at just being able to type, I mean, I'll sit down and I know I'm getting ready to type a sermon and I'm just like, boom, I got the, I got the, the remember, I, I had already done some study, read a lot of verses and stuff. Now I got the potential title. I got uh, the heading introduction, point one, point two, point three, conclusion. I mean, I've already typed all that out. So I've got my format. And, uh, and what I'll often do is I'll have uh, those main points up here. Okay, so I've got title. Oh, let's phrase that. Got title. Uh, I've got intro one, two, three and conclusion. Okay, now that's a basic. This is this is just very very basic. Now sometimes there's four points, five points, seven points, sometimes there's only two points. All right, so don't get stuck with thinking it always has to be three points. There is something about three points that seems to work itself really well into the time slot and and all that, but uh, usually I've got this uh, just basic down on there. And then what I'll have on my computer is everything beyond this point I'll just copy and paste all my verses, a whole bunch of thoughts I'll write down and all that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull from all that. <laughs> I'm pointing down here, but you understand, like you got to scroll down. And I'll pull from all that, copy and paste, and plug them in sometimes in these different places. And this is similar to if you like to write on a tablet. How many guys that preach sermons write on a tablet? <laughs> Not at all. A napkin, something. <laughs> I've seen you write on a napkin before. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, you know, sometimes now, depending on the situation, you know, I had to preach a sermon one time and I didn't have anything else except for, uh, this is my lack of preparation, but except I was in the hotel and I had a little hotel, uh, tablet <laughs> and a pen and I had to do it that way. I just, while everybody else was sleeping, I had a light on and I'm writing cause I have to get ready, uh, for some upcoming sermons. And, uh, you know, what you'll do at this point is, all these notes that you're making in the rough draft, uh, you know, you're like drawing arrows and you're crossing things out. And you, if you got a pencil, you're erasing things and all that. Well, that's basically what I do on the computer under here. 
you know, there's delete, there's copy paste, and there's moving stuff around. Same principle, okay? But uh, but this is just a way. And and I'm saying that some of you guys have been through this process, and it seems pretty easy to you. But there are some people that sit down on a blank piece of paper, and they're like, I don't know, how do I write a sermon? Right. Well, some of it's just trial and error. Just put it out there. Start thinking through. You've already done a lot of study of the text and done a lot of Bible reading. And some of this will start coming uh, to you. I'll give some more points in a minute. But uh, so you might find it easier. Some people do find it easier to lay it out on paper and scribble out that way. I went through a little phase, just my kind of artistic and creative uh uh, brain where I just for fun I would draw my 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 sermon notes. <laughs> it didn't last very long because it would take a while. But I would have like two pages of like these drawn out you know different pictures and I mean it had words too. But I would like do all this fancy stuff and it was just something that I just did for fun. But look, that's going to be time consuming. This is going <laughs> to be a whole lot faster. But maybe you're the type that likes to have all the little arrows and the and the different things. Now, I'll say this, I'm getting ahead of myself, but when I have my final sermon written out, the, one of the last things I'll do is write some of those little notes and put some arrows and stuff like that because these are my own little thoughts to me, you know, how to preach this sermon that I'm getting ready to preach. So number two, by the way, is arrows. So talk about preparation. I forgot my uh, parentheses there on number two. Instead of uh, deleting, using copy paste, some would rather cross things out, erase, draw arrows. And, uh, you know, these are just little notes. Whatever works for you, that's the main thing. But if you don't know what works for you, I would suggest learning how to do that. It's a lot faster. All right. And remember that you're not necessarily committed to all the material on your rough draft. All right. This is this is important. I'm writing a bunch of stuff out, but I'm not committed to when I first started preaching. I would have like five pages of notes and I would feel like I had to preach all of that. And I was thinking, how am I going to get all that out? Right. Well, the thing is, that's a big part of editing is you got to get rid of some of that and say that doesn't really belong in this sermon. It's great stuff. I spent a lot of time studying it, but there's no reason to bring it up in the sermon. OK, and so uh, so you're not committed to all the material on your rough draft and will probably be including a lot of material that will uh, uh, get deleted as you narrow down the sermon to the right size. Uh, two things you'll be eliminating. You'll be eliminating material that might fit in the message, but it's less valuable uh, in that sermon. So like I explained last week how I will take like, uh, not, you know, just kind of go up. Depending on time, sometimes you're relying a lot heavily on the verses that you already know because you don't have time to go through like I showed last week and, uh, and look up every verse in the Bible that says that. That's my favorite thing to do, but sometimes you just don't have the time to do that. So you have to do a quick quick version of that. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes you've done that and you're like, man, there's like 10 great verses that prove my point. Well, guess what? You're going to lose everybody after you read all 10 verses to them. So you have to choose like the best ones out of that. And, uh, same thing on, uh, preaching expository. Like, so if you're preaching through a series, like I'm going through Hebrews Sunday mornings in Iola and I'm preaching through a series, I already know where I'm going, wherever I left off, in the last lesson, that's in the last message, that's where I'm going to pick up. So that's pretty easy. But if you have an assignment, like I'm giving you guys to preach, and maybe you want to preach an expository message from a story or something like that, and you got to choose that story, here's the problem. Some people will pick a topic, and then they'll pick a story, and that story deals a little bit with that topic, and then they'll use that story. But the thing is, there's a lot, maybe somewhere is a way more powerful story that would prove that point better. So if you're just trying to prove a point, you know, maybe uh, maybe you have to do you have to dig a little bit deeper, and that's why I say, when you first start putting together a message, you might not even know exactly what style you're going to preach. Now, if I give you a challenge and say, okay, you're going to preach expository, then you have to find an expository message. If I say you got to preach on such and such topic, you don't know how you're going to preach that, and so you have to start like doing all the study preparation until you something will click in your mind eventually, and you'll say, hey, I know this is the type of sermon I want to preach. Uh, brother, uh, brother Justin, I know he talks to me more about it, the process, uh, whenever he's putting something together. And sometimes, man, he's, he'll call me and tell me his whole message. Call me like the next day and say, man, I changed it. <laughs> right. Cause that's going through the editing process, you know, your rough draft. And he's like, no, 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 this works better. You know, I found this other verse over here. And sometimes at the end, not even the same message that you started with. I think everyone that's preached here has probably uh, uh, come up with that uh, before as well. But, you know, the Lord just kind of leads you in your study process and, and, and particular things going on in your life. Uh, sometimes he'll use those and that's what you end up preaching. Okay.
Also, you'll eliminate material that doesn't uh, fit the main point or the sub points of your text at all. And here's what I want to say about that. Sometimes it's really difficult to eliminate material. You know, there's, there are times where I've spent like two days studying a certain, uh, a lot of times it's something that's not even, uh, you remember last week I talked about studying the secular, a secular view of whatever that topic is. Sometimes I'll spend like a day or two days or a week or two weeks if I know the sermon's coming up, studying a particular subject from like a worldly perspective. And then after two weeks of studying that, I might find, you know, it really isn't even that important to my message. And I have to cut all that out. And you're mad about that. And you're like, hey, I spent all that time studying that. I want to, I want to say something about it. Well, here's the deal. No study is wasted study, right? It might come up in another message down the road, you know, or here's what I do. Uh, I, in Sunday school, I, I throw a lot of things on the Sunday school that I feel like is helpful to everybody, but it's stuff that has nothing to do with, uh, the, you know, the preaching or whatever. So here's what I'll do. Like if I do one of these word studies for a sermon, I'll just preach the word study. And if you've ever seen one of those types of messages, you know what I'm talking about, but I'll just, I'll put that into a sermon form, uh, you know, using all the, all these words, references that don't have anything to do with the sermon that I was initially you know, doing that study for. I don't know if that made any sense to you. And then I did something in uh, Sunday school before that I just called deleted scenes. And I was like unashamedly uh, admitting that, hey, this is stuff that I studied and I really enjoyed it, but it doesn't work into my message. So I'm going to do it for Sunday school (laughs) because you get an opportunity to use that. So no study that you do is wasted. I don't believe, I, I believe you can study anything. You go to libraries, pick a book and study that. God could use that at some point You know, because he's going to use the tools that you have in your brain. If you're, you know, dedicated to him, he's going to use the tools that you have in your brain to be able to teach somebody or to do whatever. I remember one time I started watching uh, some kind of YouTube video about cleaning tools, restoring tools. And I was like, all right, this is kind of cool, but why am I wasting my time with this? And I did, and, and YouTube can be a time waster, okay? Don't get caught up in that. <laughs> but uh, for whatever reason, I used that. And it was in the back of my head, like, that's pretty a neat skill to use sometime, but I don't know wherever I'd, I'd ever use that. Well, I ended up knocking on a door in Iola of a guy who used to come to our church a long time ago. And, uh, and I sat down, and he wasn't interested, wasn't talking. But guess what he had playing in the other room on his TV, now, it wasn't, it wasn't the exact type of thing that I was watching, but it was something that led into a conversation. And it's so weird how he perked up, and all of a sudden we had something in common, and I was able to talk intelligent, intelligently to him about that subject somewhat. <laughs> and uh, uh, and it, God just used it. And then opened a the door, we were able to talk. You know, the guy already had a salvation testimony, so he didn't end up getting saved. He was already saved. He didn't end up coming to church, but it doesn't matter. The Lord used that conversation and we had a good conversation. I helped instill some different things in him that he had been struggling with. And I walked away from that thinking, you know what? There is really no such thing as useful knowledge. I mean, um, useless knowledge. <laughs> Whatever is in your head, God can use it for something, you know? And even if it's a bad thing, like we don't want to dwell on it, but maybe God uses a bad experience in your life. I'm not saying go out and, and get a whole bunch of these, but if you've already got them, God can use that so that you can teach somebody else, you know, not to go through that or how to deal with that situation. And, and God can use it. So just be open for the Holy Spirit to use what's already in your head and in your brain. But it is difficult when you're coming up with a sermon to narrow it down. You'll learn after experience about how long your sermon notes need to be to fill a certain time. So I usually preach about 45 minutes, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. It just depends. Uh, sometimes you're done and it's like, why keep dragging it out? I've already said what I need to say. Uh, but usually I go for about 45 minutes and I know, now this is going to be different for everybody, but I know the, why, the way that I make my notes, it's usually about a page and a half. Interestingly enough, this is a page and a half. Usually my notes are, are this way, but same, same idea, a page and a half. And I know that's going to take me about 45 minutes. Now, it depends if I've got a lot of verses that I write out to read. I can't, you can't count that. That's not going to, you know what I mean? So, but you get used to how, how far it is. And if you've got five pages of notes, you know oh, something's got to go. <laughs> so I can use it in another message or something, but it's got to go. And it's okay. It's okay. Sometimes more than one point 
you'll have to combine them together into one point. Like I don't have to dwell on these two aspects. I can just combine that all into one point. And sometimes that's just really what it's about. Uh, let me see here. Uh, C, as you start typing out your points, consider ways to make these points easier for your audience to follow and or remember. Okay, now you don't want to stretch this too far um, and start like reading into things that aren't there or making it. Sometimes it just gets kind of weird. You know, uh, everything, every time a preacher gets up there, everything's alliterated in a certain way. And it's like, I don't know, just my personal opinion. Sometimes it goes too far, but sometimes it just naturally happens. Okay, so go back to Hebrews 4. He already read it, uh, and maybe it's a familiar passage, of a, a, a well-loved passage. And uh, this last Sunday, we're preaching through Hebrews on Sunday mornings in Iola, and last Sunday we were in chapter 4, and uh, I kind of ended up in an interesting situation here because I'm looking at this context, and I'm, and I'm thinking about these, and I'm thinking about what it's talking about when it's talking about God's rest, entering into God's rest. And in the context of Hebrews, I mean, chapter 6 starts with, Therefore, leaving the principle of the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. And so I believe that the whole kind of concept uh, of Hebrews is saying, OK, you're a believer now. You know, let's leave those principal things and go on into perfection. And when I'm reading chapter four, it's talking about entering into his rest. And we use that a lot as a salvation passage. And I think that the application is there. I don't think that it's wrong to do that. But I was kind of struggling with, well, how do I show from this passage what I'm trying to say and what I'm thinking? And, and I'm looking at all this. I look back, obviously, at the, the, the psalm where he's quoting from when he says, uh, entering into God's rest, you know, uh, like the children of, of Israel in the day of provocation. And, and, uh, and I looked at, at psalm where he, the, the psalm that he talks about that, and then I went back to uh, Deuteronomy or Numbers, wherever they talk about that story where they went up and they only went so far and they didn't get to enter in because they said, oh, no, they're giants in the land, and they got scared. They didn't trust in the Lord, so they ended up wandering around, around the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. But I'm like, what are the points of the sermon going to be? And then when I read it, this just jumped out at me. Look at verse uh, verse 1. Let us therefore fear. Okay, I keep reading. I get to verse 11. Let us labor. I get to verse 14. At the end of that verse, let us hold fast our profession. Verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly bef uh, unto the throne of grace. And I thought, those are four points right there <laughs> for the sermon. I don't even have to think about what the points are. They're there already. And so number one, you know, don't fear. Number two, and then you have to listen to the sermon to see what I came up with that. But I've got my points, and now I'm, I'm showing under each of those points. And so if nothing else, I feel like that helps somebody remember, like Hebrews 4. You know, I remember seeing something about Hebrews 4. Oh, yeah, there's four points. Four, let us. Let us is in the, in the chapter 4. So sometimes you're preparing a sermon, and something just jumps out at you. And you're just like, whoa, God's already given us the outline. Why should I try to squeeze, you know, squeeze another thought into the text? Okay, So sometimes the points can come naturally from the text. Sometimes the points will be easy to alliterate. A-L-L-I-T-E-R-A-T-E. -L -L -E. I had to look it up. Alliterate. Okay, And that means all the points start with the same letter. Okay, I've heard a lot of sermons that... Every letter, every uh, sentence of the point starts with a P, right? And so remember the three P's, the first P and then the second P. And then, now, I don't remember the sermon, but I think the first sermon that you preached here, do you, do you have any idea what it was? Do you remember? I don't remember what it was, but I remember you did something with that that was, that was <laughs> memorable, even though I forgot it. If I thought about it long enough, I think I'd remember it. Man, I can't remember what it was, but, but he took that, and, and, and I thought... I thought that's something that's memorable. It's ironic that I forgot it, but seriously, it was memorable <laughs> for a while. <laughs> now you know what I feel like. No, I'm just <laughs> somebody will, sometimes you'll preach a message and then like that same week, somebody will say, have you ever thought of this? And then they'll say something. You'll be like, I just preached that exact same thing. <laughs> but you're not going to say that because you're just glad that they learned it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> anyway, the point was sometimes... There's, a, there's some, something that starts with the same letter. 
and uh, and that's called alliterating. Sometimes uh, the points will easily form an acrostic. <clears throat> One great example of this, probably almost every preacher has, has, has preached on this at some point, is Matthew 7, 7. Matthew 7, 7 says, ask. All right, they're even all capitalized for you. These are the points, A-S-K. And it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So you got ask, seek, and knock, right? So I've heard a lot of sermons. Three points, ask, seek, knock. Just easy. It's right there in the text as you're reading through that. And so sometimes it just jumps out and it's like, why try to make it any more complicated? This is something that's easy to remember, okay? And in the example that I provided last week, I don't expect you to have it with you right now, but on the alcohol, uh, the subject of alcohol and God's commands concerning alcohol, basically there were two sub points. So remember, every message... Your title is pretty much going to tell you, at least the generic title. You might change it later, but the generic title is pretty much going to tell you what the main point of the sermon is. Okay, that's the way I try to do it anyway. And so uh, if you, you know, that's your main point. Maybe you have a sentence in there, and in that sermon that I provided last week, I forgot to, to do that. But usually before I do the points, there'll be one sentence that is like a sentence. I'll try to say that sentence before I give the points. And it's basically saying, this is what the message is about. You know, and might even it might even say the points. You know, so you already know them in your head. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, that there's a name for that in in uh, hermeneutics, but I can't remember what it is or homiletics. But uh, uh, you want to be able to say this is my main point. This is the point of the sermon. And then you got sub points underneath that. Okay, so in that case, uh, you know, the A, the S, the K might be the sub points, and. Uh, in the sermon I did on alcohol, the subpoints were this: those commands to specific people, and those commands that are just general for everybody. Okay, so God told you know those under the Nazarite vow what to do in regards to alcohol. He told pastors what to do in regards to alcohol. He told priests that were going into the temple uh, some commands regarding alcohol. But then there were some general commands that had to everybody. So I took all the research that I did and I had those two. Now there's nothing super memorable about that, but it's just two points and there's nothing, why try to do something fancy with that, right? And so not every sermon has to be uh, fancy. And so, uh, and then you continue this process of editing and, and all this uh, until it's an adequate uh, length and you have simplified and a sufficient amount of material to prove or reinforce the main point of your sermon, okay? And the last one's polish up, but I'll uh, polish up the final draft and prepare to preach it. But I'm going to skip that just for a minute. I'm talking kind of fast because I wanted to be able to do this. So last week I said, like, my original plan for this lesson was, hey, we'll just create a sermon, right, just out of the air. We'll just create a sermon. And then I thought, this, there's no way. How could we do that? There's no way we can do We don't have our resources and all that kind of stuff. But today I thought about something real simple. And actually I've heard uh, it put this way, and I, and I thought this was a great point. A lot of people, in fact, before anybody gets up here to preach, one of the prerequisites is we say we want to make sure that they can adequately preach the gospel at the door because that's the most important preaching. You know, and I remember uh, as an assistant pastor, you know, kind of complaining, like I did not really like complaining all the time, but in my mind thinking, man, I wish I had more opportunities to preach. And it didn't matter how I, I got it. I always felt like I didn't have enough. Well, I got them now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll give you what you asked for. Uh, but, uh, but at the time, I remember being convicted about that because I realized, you know what? Every time I go preach the gospel, I'm preaching a message. And so why should I be so concerned about going behind the pulpit unless I just want to be seen by men? And so when we go out and we preach the gospel, that's the most important preaching that there is to do, okay? So I've heard it explained this way, and it's a great, it's a great uh, thought. If you're going to get up here and preach, it's very similar to preaching the gospel, right? You've got an outline in your mind, you've got the verses in your mind, and you preach, you know, you preach those main points, and then you you just talk about those different things as you're doing that, and that translates pretty well over to whatever else you're going to preach about, okay? And so let's give an example. Pretty much everybody in here has a gospel presentation. I'm I'm assuming that when we go out and preach the gospel, what we're going to preach something. So a common, a common title, we might say, is, uh, is uh, the Bible way 
to heaven. All right? Now, that might be the final title that you came up for your, with your sermon, you know, for your sermon. And I know most of us stole this offline, but that's okay. <laughs> Somebody came up with this, so we'll go through the process. The first title might have been, How to Know for Sure You're Going to Heaven, or, uh, or you know, Four Points. Now, that wouldn't worry. That'd be something that you would narrow it down later. But because uh, I've seen like gospel tracts that say like four things you have to do to go to heaven. Right. So that was the final title that they came up with after they realized they had the four points. You see what I'm saying? So that same idea. Who knows what the original generic title could have been if you followed my little process here. OK. Now, introduction. Remember, you wouldn't normally just sit down and write the introduction. You're going to have to have all these thoughts first. So what you're going to do, like if you're just for the first time thinking like, what do I, how am I going to preach the Bible way to heaven? Well, you have to know what the Bible says about going to heaven. Right? And so you're going to have a whole lot of verses. And thankfully, people have done that work for us. And it's pretty easy to, uh, to simplify those a little bit. But the next step, you remember what I said about just laying out all these random verses. The next step is making sure we don't use those verses out of context. And so what you would have to do then is say, okay, all have sinned come short of the glory of God. Well, let me read that chapter and see what it's talking about. Let me make sure, because there are sometimes we could be not, you know, we could, and I've, I've heard some good gospel presentations and then somebody says a verse and I'm like, that's kind of out of context, but <laughs> you know, it's not like it's false. It's not like it's, it's heresy or something like that, but sometimes we use verses out of context. And so to actually be accurate to the Bible, we would then have to look at the context of all of those verses that we use. And uh, we would have to decide which ones don't make it because look, you could, you could rattle off right now probably five, six verses that teach us from the Bible that all of sin and come short of the glory of God, right? Or you could just get one verse that says all of sin and come short of the glory of God. <laughs> you know, we don't need 10 verses. You know, maybe you want to throw Romans 3.10, uh, there are none righteous, no, not one, and then all of sin and come short of the glory of God because they're kind of in the same area, whatever. But you're, you know, you're, you're, you're just trying to make this one point. You don't need to have 10 verses. If you do that, you're probably going to lose them. You know what I mean? And you say, no, no, but I need to be thorough and I need to have all these. Well, that's true, but you also need to make sure that they're understanding and they're listening to what you're saying. And so sometimes you have to simplify that, okay? And so most of us have come up with, uh, most of us have come up with four, well, let's just do this. Four points, like I said, four points, four things you got to do to go to heaven, okay? And so, uh, you know, one that you use, you'll often see is, uh, is uh, let me see here, realize you're a sinner or something. Realize you are a sinner. Okay, isn't that true? Kind of got to get them lost before you can get them found, somebody said. The people have to know that they need to be saved, right? So you realize that they're a sinner. There's tons of verses that we could we could put under that. So outline form, you know, the way that I usually use the old traditional, uh, you know, uh, uh, we already talked about Romans, you know, Romans 3.23. Bible says, you know, the first thing you need to do is realize that you're a sinner. Bible says, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? Uh, and you could say something like, I'm a sinner, You're a sinner. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. And so, uh, pet peeve. <laughs> but you understand, uh, you can come up with some different points under there and say, hey, other thoughts under this idea. You need to realize you're a sinner. But hey, look, I'm a sinner too. Everybody's a sinner. Nobody's perfect, right? You know, that. I'm, there's tons of things that you could do under this. Polish that up a little bit if you have time. But basically, you don't need 10,000 verses to show them that. You really just go one or two verses and they go, yeah, I got that. And this is why it's so weird that some people have that gospel presentation that's like, well, let me just take you through this list of all the commands in the Bible and show you that you're a sinner. Like I could show you in one second. <laughs> Romans 3, 23, all, no, that's more than a second. But you know, most people are like, oh yeah, I'm a sinner, right? So yeah, okay, well now that you know you're a sinner, the second point is realize, oh man, don't tell me probably just upside down too long and so uh, realize there is 
a penalty for your sins, right? So already it sounds like I'm already starting to do a, a, an alliteration. Okay, all going to start with realize, but, you know, not really. This is a somewhat of a rough draft. But you uh, understand that now that they know they're a sinner, they need to know what the penalty of their sin is. So where do we go from there? We usually go with uh, Romans 6, 23. I doubt anyone on the live stream will be able to read any of this. I don't know if you can read it. But anyway, uh, and we're saying, hey, the wages of your sin, uh, uh, the wages of sin is death. Okay. Maybe under this, you want to explain what a wage is. All right. The wages of sin. Then you want to explain what death is, not just the physical death, but then after this death, there's a, what the Bible calls a second death. And, uh, and that's eternal death, damnation in, in hell. And maybe read, uh, Man, this is not cool. Revelation 21.8. All right. And uh, uh, so then what is usually point three would be, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm not trying to alliterate, but realize, oh, come on. They were all working. Realize. Let's stick with our alliteration here. Realize Jesus is the only way. Okay? So now you're going to preach the gospel. Jesus Christ. You know, maybe Romans maybe Romans 5, 8. You know, uh, so it's for God uh, committed the, uh, His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And, and you're showing them that, hey, you know, there's a penalty for sin, but, Jesus, but God doesn't want us to go to hell. And so... He came up with a way. He showed His love to us. He commended His love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, right? Remember? Christ died for us. And so now you're explaining, uh, explaining that. You know? And then so what's the last thing you have to do? Oh, man, how do I, how do I realize that you have to? <laughs> so you might say, call on the Lord. You know, conf conf confess, confess the Lord, uh, Jesus Christ. And then so you take Him to uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10 or... Or whatever you know obviously this is just really quick just a random there's lots of ways you can do that we've all got certain uh certain ways of doing it quite honestly mine changes it shouldn't i should probably stick with the same plan every time uh but uh but so this process that somebody came up with to preach the gospel at the door and you've kind of memorized it most of us i mean the hardest part about going soul winning isn't preaching this if you've already got it memorized and you've got your your bible marked and all that kind of stuff it's not it's the point from knocking on the door to getting the opportunity to present this. That's the hardest part about preaching the gospel, you know. And so, uh, and so we, we're trying to get them to this point where they'll say, sure, let, well, go ahead and show me. And then you can preach to them. And that's what you're doing. You're, you're taking your sermon notes, maybe out of your Bible or your sermon notes that are in here, and you're preaching them this. And, and obviously I didn't develop this sermon very well. But, but so now when you're polishing this up, now we just wrote down a handful of notes here. And in the process of putting together a sermon, uh, the same kind of idea, start looking something like that, it'll start coming together a little bit. Now you want to look over your sermon and correct any mistakes you find. This is the point. I usually don't have time to polish up my sermons, and so sorry, but this is, this is why I make so many mistakes whenever I preach. I just didn't have the time for this part. But uh, you need to look over your sermon and correct any mistakes that you find. Make sure that Everything makes sense. Uh, you know, all the all the necessary verses are there. Add helpful illustrations, definitions. Maybe there's a word and you're like, you know, not everybody knows what that word means. And so look up the definition. Maybe you're going to share that with them. Maybe an object lesson that you think would fit. Well, don't just squeeze it in there for no purpose. But if you think, hey, that has a good purpose, that'll be helpful to drive this point home. Uh, maybe add, you can add that in as part of your polishing up the sermon. Uh, it adds a whole lot to the to the depth of the of the sermon, and so you know how, how many of you guys on this part, you know, so uh, you start talking about you know realize Jesus is the only hope for salvation. Somewhere under there, it's the gift of God, right? He gave His Son, Jesus Christ. It's the gift of God. So how many of us use the illustration? It's like if I was to give you a gift, 
it's okay. Now, I know that when we preach a message, we're giving somebody the gospel. We're not trying to, to use our own wisdom and all that stuff. But at the same time, we want them to understand a point. So we have to use some pictures sometimes. We have to put something in their language and their understanding. That's an important part about preaching the gospel or preaching at all is making sure that people get what we're telling them. You know, they have to get that into their head. And so, uh, so sometimes it helps to use an illustration. You know, like using this sermon as an illustration might help this uh, idea a little bit. And so using the example about if this was a gift and I asked you to give $10 for it, was it a gift? No. How many people have seen like a light go off in someone's eyes when you use that illustration? Oh, I get it. Gift. Okay, it's a gift. So then it's not works. And that's what you want people to get to that point. Okay, you're getting it, right? Now, what do we do to receive that gift? And that's how you're finishing up your point. Well, when you're preaching from the pulpit... You want your sermon to be such that it's going to do that. Now, I know guys who can preach from the pulpit like we preach from the door. Like most of us don't have to, just a minute. All right, point number one. You know what I mean? Most of us don't have to do that. We've got it memorized. And I know some guys that get their sermon to that point. It's usually evangelists that have preached their sermon like 20 times, okay? <laughs> but I know some pastors that can do it pretty well. By the time they get to Sunday, they've got, their, they've got it down. Maybe they just got a few notes marked in their Bible, and they're walking around, and they're preaching, and you're like, that guy never looked at his notes. And maybe the average person doesn't notice that, but I do, because whenever I preach, I'm, I'm glued to my notes, and I have to like make myself, like, whenever I'm telling an illustration or something, I can actually look at people in the eyeballs. Uh, otherwise, I'm like, now, what did I write here? What was that verse? And uh, you've, have you ever seen me like get up to preach? And I'm like, oh, no, where are my notes? I freak out <laughs> because I'm like, and one time I had to preach a message and I didn't have my notes. And thankfully, I had enough. Uh, I don't remember. I got through it somehow. But uh, and one time I forgot my notes on the way here and had to rewrite it in an hour and a half from Iola to here. And I'm sure I left stuff out, but it ended up being one of those messages that I could almost preach without my notes because I went through it so many times. <laughs> All right. So now real quickly, polishing up. Uh, after we've done all that, we double check our scriptures. Uh, this is an important part for me is marking my Bible. Uh, and so one of the things I'll do, like I didn't have my Bible that I, that I preached out of Sunday. So when I was showing you about that from Hebrews, I had to underline all the let us parts because I knew I was going to say real quick and, and I didn't have time to, to find those. I had to be able to see what was underlined. So sometimes marking your Bible will do that and you can just preach your points, you know, straight from your Bible because it's already marked. Uh, but that's important to do. And then uh, we, I like to have tabs. Like the only time I have time to do this again is when we're coming from Iola to here, we're traveling. If you've ever ridden in the car with us back and forth, uh, I'm not saying it's the safest thing to do, but Valerie uh, Sharice has usually got my Bible and I've got my notes like this while I'm driving. And I'm like, all right, read this first. I'm, I'm that quick. I'm telling you, my eyes are on the road. I read this first to me and she'll read it and I'll make sure it's uh, it's the right verse. Uh, every once in a while, I'm like, no, that's not the right verse. Where's that verse that talks about, you've seen me do it anyway. <laughs> so uh, that's the preparation. I don't always have time to do that preparation, unfortunately. All right, but it's really important that you do so you don't get up there and say the wrong verse or something like that, which I um, uh, unfortunately do a lot of times. So on the way up here, a lot of times we'll mark that, we'll read through those. And then here's something that I always try to do. This I almost always do. To me, this is one of the most important parts for me being ready to preach from my sermon notes. Because sometimes you look at this. Now this actually has, okay, here's an example all the scriptures, this is how I do almost every time. All the first thing I do is all the scriptures, I'm, I highlight yellow. I want those to jump out at me because I don't want to forget to, to use those scriptures. That's the most important part. In, in this type of setting, all the underline that I need to tell you that this is what you're supposed to uh, fill in the blank, I put in red. You see, so now that when I'm, I'm reading this, jumps right out at me. So now when I'm preaching from my sermon notes, and let's say I've got this. Here's what I do. This is just my, my way. Now, I never wrote an introduction, but knowing what you're going to preach, now you can put together an introduction, uh, you know, before you give the points. All right. So what I do is uh, first thing I do, like I said, highlight in yellow all of my uh, all of my verses because I want to be able to see. I want them to just jump out at me. OK. And then I, everything that's a, you know, everything that's introduction, everything that's conclusion and all my main points, 
I underline them in red. You don't have to do this. Do whatever works for you, but I'm just showing you. Oh, by the way, let me, let me say this, okay? So let's say you're new at presenting the gospel, and this actually confused you, right? Here's what I did when I was first presenting the gospel. The last point is, is you know, call on the Lord to save you, you know, or confess Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, here's what I did. Really, I feel like, uh, I feel like these two could actually be combined together, right? So here, here's what I did, and I had heard this, this acronym somewhere else, okay? And I don't use the exact same points because I don't know who came up, up with it or what their points were, but they had ABC. They said the gospel is e as simple as ABC, right? Don't say that in the wrong circles, like easy believism. <laughs> <laughs> it's as simple as ABC. And I really want to make these t-shirts up, by the way. Uh, I've told some, some people this, but uh, when we had a youth group in Iola, uh, we were trying to think of all these different things. I want to make these t-shirts. And on the front says, do you know your ABCs? And on the back, it was going to say, A, admit you are a sinner in need of a Savior. B, believe that Jesus Christ is your only hope for salvation. C, call on the Lord to save you or confess Jesus Christ, however you want to word that, uh, so that you can be saved. And underneath all those have like a, a, a one or two scriptures from the Bible. And my idea was to put that on all the teenagers, you know, in our classes, that they would wear that to school. And the person in the desk behind me, admit you're a sinner. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so, uh, uh, but you see how that turned into something memorable, ABC. And, and see how you had, to, uh, you had to edit it by saying, Look, I don't really need to be four points. I think I can combine this to three points. And so that's all part of the process of, of polishing something up. But anyway, back to this. So then I need to separate my main points from my sub points. And so I'll take a green. Who cares what color it is? But this is something I do. Con contrast color. And, uh, and I'll do my ABC. Maybe you've got one, two, three like you do here. I'll take like a light blue. And I'll underline those. But here's what I'm doing, okay, also. Now, sometimes I'll do that real fast, and then I'll go back through it. Here's what I'm doing also. I'm, re I'm, I'm going through all these points again in my head, okay? And I'll do it like this. Realize that, and, and depending on that, I'm just using this as an example. But realize that you are a sinner. And I'll underline that real big so I know if I just glimpse, you know, took a glimpse at this, word, at this uh, sentence here, that part's going to stand out at me. And this is just an example. Maybe I want to emphasize, you are a sinner. I'll circle this so that I can just get up here and, and I'm just trying to translate this to preaching from the pulpit so that I can look down at my notes and real quickly say, you are a sinner. You see what I'm saying? Uh, realize that you are a sinner. And so little things like that would just help me. Whatever works for you, uh, do that. But then so, you know, you are a sinner. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner, you know what I'm saying? I'll just do stuff like that. But what it's also doing is reiterating in my mind what my message is. And if I can do this step right before I preach it, it helps a whole lot of going through that. And if I'm ready in advance and then I have to come back and preach it later on, I'll go through it again and I'll reread all the verses and stuff like that so that it's fresh in my head as close as I can to being time to preach. And so anyway, that's the best that I could do from this. I felt like... Uh, I just felt like we needed to go from the beginning of the process to the end of the process as quickly as I can, but I don't think we can afford to go more than two uh, sermons on that. So I got it into two lessons, and hopefully that helps somebody. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for our voices and our minds and those things that we uh, have been blessed with to be able to communicate your word and to understand it. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us not... Uh, uh, not uh, take that lightly, but that we would uh, take advantage of every opportunity we have to use those skills that you've, gave, you've given us and the ability, and that we would uh, go out and preach the gospel. And for those who are learning and have a desire to preach and teach from the pulpit, Lord, I pray that you'll help them take these principles as well and learn and grow and use the things that will help them, Lord, but maybe something I said will uh, 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 will help them and set them on the right way. And I pray, Lord, that from this ministry, both here in Iola, whatever you allow me to accomplish, from that ministry, Lord, many great preachers will come out who can uh, 
adequately uh, handle the word and and uh, and preach, Lord, much better than I can. That they would be effective in reaching many people, not just with the gospel, but also with uh, the ability to teach and disciple and uh, make more uh, soul winners. And Lord, I pray you'll bless this work. Thank you for the many uh, faithful people and the surrendered hearts and, and givers, Lord. And I pray that you'll just bless them uh, as we continue to do your work. Jesus, in my prayer. Amen.